good Thursday morning. I hope you're having a good day. Um, trying to wake up. I've had some coffee this morning. Um, looks like it's going to be a rainy day, um, but we have the sunshine of God's Word in our hands, and we're in Colossians chapter 3. Uh, it is going to be a lengthy uh, study this morning, and we're going to be excited about getting from chapter 1 that was doctrinal teaching about the sufficiency of Christ to chapter 2 where he warns us uh, that people are going to come and try to delude us, get us off track from the focus and the standard of Jesus Christ and the sufficiency of him. And so when we get to chapter 3 and chapter 4 today and tomorrow, we're going to see how this practically works out. Now, um, Satan always wants to take God's order and turn it all around. Because remember, the order that God puts out is part of his character. And so Satan hates anything that points to the character of God. And so he wants to change that all around. And so we're going to talk a lot about that today. If you have not already read Colossians chapter 3, stop. Go read it. Remember, the purpose that we're doing these studies is not uh, so you can listen to me. It's not so uh, I can, you know, give you wisdom. No, I'm trying to teach you how to go through a text, how to interpret the text, how to explain the text and apply the text so that you uh, can turn around and teach someone else God's Word. Uh, the goal is 2 Timothy 2.2, that as someone taught me, now I'm teaching you, and you will go be able to teach others. And the idea is multiplication for the kingdom of God. So read it, understand it. You say, oh, I, don't, I read it, I don't understand it. Read it again. Uh, well, you said, I, I don't have enough time. Well, here's the reality. Uh, each of us have 24 hours in a day. And in those 24 hours, we're all equal. It's how we prioritize uh, that 24 hours. And so I would warn you, don't let the temporary things of this world cloud out you or I dealing with the permanent, the eternal things. Um, so there's a warning there. Colossians chapter 3. Father God, we love you. We thank you for another day you've given to us here. Um, we are looking forward to a day of fruitful labor, work that you're going to guide us into. But Father, before we can be involved in your work, we want it to be your work. And so, Father, we're coming to commune with you, uh, to know your will for today. Show us, Father. Guide us. Interrupt our plans today. And, Father, in the interruptions, as we encounter different people today, may we first, Father, see them, not see past them or see through them, but may we truly see the people we encounter today. And may the ones that have surrendered to you, may we have fellowship and bear one another's burdens together as we share life. And Father, as we come across people who don't know you, may they see something in us that causes them pause and may then send them to question uh, what we're about. And at that point, Father, put words in our mouths. May the words that we're communing with you over right now, may they be fresh and may you call them back to mind and may we appoint people not to our own goodness, but to your goodness and to your glory. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. In Colossians chapter 3, again, as Paul loves to do, he begins the chapter with the word, therefore. So remember, anytime we see the word therefore, it's echoing back. Um, remember, this was supposed to be, this is a letter that was supposed to be read all in one sitting. 
And so the therefore would be very fresh. As we split it up into days, sometimes we get a little foggy. So uh, this therefore is pointing back up to verse 20. Look at verse 20 of chapter 2. If you have died with Christ to the elementary principles of the world, so if you've been saved, you've died to the old life, being controlled by the lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, boastful pride of life, and a standard that you can attain to in your own flesh. You, you've died to that. Um, and look what it says at the end of verse 22. You've died to submitting to the commandments and the teachings of men. What does that look like? Well, the world's teaching, man's thoughts are that if I do good things outwardly, it will help me to be right with God. So the outward things that I do are going to help me inwardly, which is totally false and totally the opposite of God's plan. God always works inward to outward, and Satan always wants to turn that around. Look what he says in uh verse 23 at the end all these outward things that we do to try to get right with God they really have no value against fleshly indulgence they're not going to change my inward desire it may look make me look better uh, in front of other people they may think well of me however it's not going to change my heart the question is then, how does the heart change? All of chapter 3 is going to be about that. So remember, we've already got a equation for heart change. It's in the great commandment. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, mind. The result will be that you will love your neighbor. And so we work backwards on that. So we start with our mind. After I've surrendered my life to the Lord Jesus Christ, he said, you've died. You've died to your old way of thinking. So now your thinking is being renewed by the word of God and empowered by the spirit. So the word of God and the Holy Spirit come together. And I start drawing strength from the word of God rather than my own understanding. And my soul, so we've got mind, strength, then soul. The soul is your will or your choices. This is why the word submission is so important. Because as a Christian, I have submitted, I've surrendered control of my life to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now I'm going to make decisions, my soul, based on what God says, not what I think. Now, here's the awesome thing. The longer I do this, what he says does become what I think. This is the third stage of spiritual growth where the word becomes implanted in us. And so then my heart changes. I can't just go out and change my heart, which is my priorities. I can't just go out and have a New Year's resolution and say, I'm a, I've got a new heart this year. No. The process for heart change in generally speaking, is start with the mind, work to the strength, work to the choices, work to the heart change. Now, Paul is going to get even more detailed and specific of what that process looks like. And he's going to say the result of that great commandment is supernatural love for my neighbor. Naturally, and he, in the great commandment, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. So naturally speaking, I love me and I will use you to further me. But in Christ that gets turned around and I am willing to deny myself to love you. The flesh, indulging the flesh is always using other people to further myself. Therefore, he says, chapter three, verse one, if you have been raised, so 220 says you've died, but you didn't stay dead. You, you've been raised to what? You've been raised with Christ. Okay? So just as Christ has supernaturally resurrected, so have you. And if you go back to Philippians uh, chapter 3, verse 10, 
where it says that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering that I might attain to the resurrection of the dead. Three aspects there. Getting to know God, first I have to have spiritual resurrection. That's what he's speaking of here. If you've surrendered your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, you have been born again, spiritually alive. You were dead before. Now that means the, the door is open for you to have communion with God the Father through the work that Jesus Christ has done. That's what Jesus was talking about in John 17, 3, where he says, this is eternal life that they may know you, the one true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. You can't, the door can't get open to a right relationship with God the Father without the work that Jesus Christ has done. So here he's saying, so you've been raised up with Christ. You, now you, you've, you've received this spiritual resurrection. Now you're embarking on this suffering part, the fellowship of his suffering sanctification with ultimate glorification where we will actually have physical eternal resurrection freed from sin boy i cannot wait for that day look what he says so in this process of being raised up with christ keep seeking what things above okay don't be just taking what people say around you and try to do good things, what are the things that are above? Where Christ is seated at the right hand of God, it says, set your what? Your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. Okay, so I want to focus on eternal things, not temporal things. I'm going to focus on the word of God. And I have to have the Holy Spirit in me in order for the word of God to um, work. If you, if you just will we'll echo forward a little bit, look at chapter 3, verse 16. He lets us in on it, but let's get to it first. He said, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you. So I've got to be in the word. And I hope through this time of quarantine, you have started disciplining yourself to be in the Word. Stop using the excuse, I just don't have time. That's a lie. If you, if you have that thought that you just don't have the time, at least say it in a truthful way. God's Word is not a real big priority in my life. Because remember, you have 24 hours today and I have 24 hours today. It's how am I going to split up that 24 hours? And here he's saying, chapter uh, 2, don't be all about trying to do outward works. I got so much to do for God today. Be about setting your mind on the internal things. When God changes me in here, it will flow out. Look what he says. Set your mind on things above, not on things of the earth. For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. Can you think of a safer refuge than you are in, with Christ hidden refuge in God the Father? Who's going to get you there? It just kind of echoes us back to John chapter 10. Um, my sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me and I give unto them eternal life and they shall never perish. Um, nobody's going to pluck them out of my hand. My Father who gave them to me is greater than all and no one is able to pluck you out of my Father's hand. So, do I have to live in fear of my own life? And the answer to that is no. I can totally live for Christ today for eternal things and I can die to myself because there is no condemnation. I don't have have to be afraid. Look what he says. Verse 4, memorize this verse. When Christ, who is our life. Let's just stop there for a second. Is Christ your life? I see bumper stickers and, you know, uh, 
t-shirts and all things. Fishing is my life. Walmart is my life. Knitting, I saw one the other day. Knitting is my life. Uh, I'm a Christian. Just saying I'm a Christian is by very definition that Christ is my life. What do I live for? I live for Christ. What does that mean? I live in Christ and through Christ to get to know God the Father. And as I get to know God the Father, I'm going to love the people around me. How am I going to love them? By helping them get to know Christ. So when he says, this is what life is, Christ, who is our life, is revealed. Okay, so the second coming. Then you will also be revealed with him in glory. This it for a believer, for a Christian, for someone who's born again, this is the goal. This is the win. The win is glorification. So right now we're in the fellowship of his suffering in the sanctification process, and it takes on many forms, whether it's dealing with my own self or dealing with the persecution from other people. It's hard. But remember, this isn't home. The goal is glorification. So remember, the, the hope, the steadfastness of hope. Remember those two, three terms, faith, love, hope. Faith is this work of faith that God is doing as I love the Lord my God, right? Then it's going to labor of love, this working out of loving my neighbor with the ultimate goal of the steadfastness of hope, which is glorification. Now, we're going to dive into verses 5 uh, through 10 or 5 through 9. And it's going to be all about the old man. Okay, so the flesh, manifestations of the fleshly nature. What he calls in chapter 2 fleshly indulgences, right? Okay, so um, we've got to be very clear of... Uh, when I see these things in my life, this is my old nature. And when I see other things, which he's going to call the new man, uh, this is my new nature uh, being made known. And so it's very important that we understand what he's saying here. Okay, so we're going to get kind of technical. So first, one of the worst uh, translated words in the New American Standard is in our next verse. He says, therefore, now remember, that therefore is put up so you died with Christ and you've been raised to Christ and now Christ is your life. So you got the picture? Christ is the center. He's the controller. I follow Christ. He is my life and the goal is to be with Christ face to face in glorification. So therefore, and then he says, consider the members of your earthly body as dead. Okay, so consider is not very, in, in my understanding of the word consider, it's that, you know, sit here and ponder. Hmm, that's not what this word means. Uh, the King James Version uses a better word, and I don't often say that. Um, but it uses the word mortify, okay? Put to death, uh, put it away. Um, this is the active voice of a verb. This is, and this is where I'm gonna get a little technical. Here, when it says put off the old man, is in the active voice, meaning I must do the action. But when we get to the put on the new man, it's in the middle voice, which means the action is going to be done to me, like a passive verb, but I, got, I have some participation in it. Okay, um, That's important because as we go through this list, Satan likes to turn it all around. So we're trying in our flesh then to do God's work. And so this is the way we do it. We try to, to do the, the new man stuff. We're trying harder to be better. And then we're hoping that as we try harder to do better, God will take care of my old fleshly nature. And that's exactly the opposite. The active verb here 
is putting off, putting to death the old man. The middle voice is the putting on the new man. So as I actively put to death my fleshly nature, God will then come in and start producing this new nature in me. Okay, but we've talked about this a lot, have we not? Okay, it looks like this. So I'm in God's word. The Holy Spirit lives within me because I'm born again. I'm in the word uh, because as 1 Peter 2 says, I love the word like a baby loves milk. So I want to be nourished. I'm in the word. The Holy Spirit starts to use the word to convict me of sin. And as he convicts me of sin, and we're going to go through a list here in just a moment of specifics, not an exhaustive list, but some very specific things that the Holy Spirit is going to convict me of. And then I, in faith, agree with the Holy Spirit and don't try to self-justify. I agree. The Holy Spirit calls it sin. I'm going to call it sin. And I'm going to confess it as sin before God, before other people. And then I'm going to turn from my sin. And going through this process of what we've been calling CCR, conviction, confession, and repentance, is a painful process. It goes against everything in our natural flesh. Our natural flesh wants to cover up, hide, to make me look good. God says, I want you to make me look good. And the way you do this is by going against your natural inclination to cover up. And I want you, by faith, to come out into the open. Fully disclose. Now, as we go through the process of CCR, it is humbling. It's also a deterrent. Next time I'm tempted, uh, I remember, and the Holy Spirit brings to mind all the pain that sin caused in my life last time. And so I, I'm not going to do that again. You see, when we sin and we just kind of move on, uh, we don't really see the damage that our sin causes. So then it's really easier to sin the next time. So this humbling process is this mortifying the flesh, putting it to death. It's your job, my job. God wants us to put to death the works of the flesh. Remember Galatians 5. Then, and only then, will he start to produce this new man in me. The reason he does this in the this way, in this order, is I can't take credit for it. If, I, if he just started to produce this new man in me, then in my flesh, I would start to think that I did it. Let's go through this list. So, therefore, I'm going to say mortify the members of your earthly body as dead. Make them dead. Kill them. E -e 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 -e. Dead to what? And these kind of go in pairs. And it's funny how one would be an inward, one would be an outward. Let's look. So we've got first, immorality and impurity. Immorality is from this word pornia. This is the Greek word, which we get pornography from. But pornia is a word, this general uncleanness. Okay? general sinfulness. Um, if you think of morals, generally speaking, is God's character, okay? The, the standard, the parameters where God says this is right. So if that's what morality is, what's immorality, it's anything outside of that, okay? What purity is, perfect submission to God's standard. What's impurity? anything outside of that. So immorality here would be the, the outward um, outward things that are against God's character. So it's a general term. Mostly in the Bible it talks about immorality being sexual immorality. Um, mo mostly focused on the lust of the flesh. 
So can I be immoral with regards to my body? Yes. But can I be immoral with regard to my eyes? Yes, I can. Can I be immoral with my pride? Totally, we're gonna to see that in a moment. Can I be totally immoral with the standard that I'm comparing myself to? Yes. So immorality is the outward, impurity is the inward. So the outward actions are the immor immorality, the uh, filthy thoughts, the thoughts against God's way are the, in, the impurity. Then he goes on to two others, passion and evil desire. So passion is acts not led by God. Uh, they're not being led by God. I'm being led by what I want. My own, another word for passion would be lust. I'm led by my lust. Uh, evil desires is the thoughts. One's the action, one's the thoughts. Let's keep going. Then we've got two. We've got greed and um, idolatry. Greed, what is that? Never enough. This is focused on the lust of the eyes. The eye is never Full. How much money is enough? Just a little bit more. I'm never full, never satisfied um, with material possessions or whatever the flesh wants. Um, and really, that the, that's the outward manifestation of an inward heart that is idolatrous, meaning my heart is set inwardly on something other than God. And so therefore I want more, want, want, want more, more, and more stuff. See, see the perversion of it? When my heart is set on God, that's a right heart. Now, how much of God do I want? Oh, I want more and more and more and more. I'm just never enough. There's, I can never fully know God. So I, continually desiring to know him more. But see, the perversion of this is when my heart is set on something other than God, on an idol, then it leads to greed. There's, it's never enough, never enough. But the, the problem is, greed leads to less and less satisfaction. Getting to know God from a right heart leads to greater and greater and greater satisfaction. That's the difference. One is built on a lie, one is built on the truth. He goes on. Look what he says. He says, for, verse 6, it is because of these things that the wrath of God will come upon the sons of disobedience. And in them you also once walked when you were living in them. But now you uh, put them all aside. Okay, now, I want to make this distinction. Before I became a Christian, I was under the wrath of God. What he talks about here, the sons of disobedience, right? And so wrath is not doled out day by day. The Bible speaks of wrath that it's storing up. And so as I go through life as an unbeliever, as a son of disobedience, I'm not dealing with my sin. I'm just living my life what I want, how I want, right? And But the wrath of God is storing up. But I'm oblivious to it. I'm just doing what comes naturally to me. Now, the opposite of that, when I become a Christian, now I'm a child of obedience. And the wrath has been taken away. I don't have to be afraid of condemnation. But now I'm under discipline. Discipline is not stored up. Discipline is doled out daily. What's the purpose of it? Remember, the purpose of wrath is punishment. The purpose of discipline is to make you better, to get to know God better. So God daily is going to be convicting you of your sin, maybe even causing th difficult things in your life to get you to come to him. But the purpose is to build you up not to punish you. So keep that in mind. He says, he gives another list of kind of manifestations of the flesh. Now, the first list is broken up. The first list was really uh, 
the, what the world would call love, kind of perverted, perverted love. And these type of things are more what the world would just say, if, if you're doing these things, you really don't love anybody. But the first group uh, that we led to always leads to this second group. Because really, the first group is just using other people. If I'm involved in immorality with you, uh, I'm just using you. Otherwise, I would submit to God's way and would love you the way God wants me to love you. But we can go all the way through the list. Look at this list. First, anger. What is anger? Uh, this is something, uh, let's describe it like resentfulness, bitterness, inward bitterness. Where, what does anger come from? It comes from this desire for me to be God and other people aren't recognizing that. They're not. Um, we were in our class last night uh, on spiritual authority and uh, I, I read this quote this week that says, other people do not want to hear your opinion. What other people want to hear is their opinion speak, spoken from your voice. They want to hear their opinion in your mouth. And think through that. People don't want to hear your opinion. They want to hear their opinion in your mouth. Now, that's putting ourselves in the God position. This is what causes us anger is when people won't submit. Remember, what does God want? He wants us. Not, he doesn't want to hear our opinion. He wants to hear his words come out of our mouth. So what do we do? We turn that around and turn ourselves into little gods. And then if you're trying to do that and I'm trying to do that, then we're not going to be cooperating with each other. And what is the result? Inward anger. And this inward anger is going to lead to open outward wrath. This is called just an outburst of anger. And so inward anger is going to come out in wrath. Now, <laughs> some people are have no uh, real capacity for keeping in anger, so they're all the time blowing. But then there's other people that it builds up for a long time. Uh, but it, it comes from the same part of bitterness and resent from really thinking, I'm God. This is the manifestation of the flesh. What else? We've got two here, malice and slander. Uh, malice is inwardly, this is the inward part. I really wanna harm other people. I wanna hurt you. Now, if we're honest in our flesh, that thought comes up quite often in our lives. And as Christians, the Holy Spirit's gonna be dealing with us with that thought. Um, this malice. The slander is when I start actually coming out and harming others with my words. Um, so see the inward and the outward. I have malice toward you, and instead of going to you and dealing with it, getting it right, I go to other people and I start talking about harming you. Let's go on. We've got abusive speech, which is connected, but it's words meant to wound. Okay, so really closely connected. Lying, um, we've got lying and pride here. Lying is the characteristic of Satan. Uh, the, the greatest outward sign of Satan is lying. He's the father of lies. Jesus is truth, Satan is lies. So what's the heart of lies? Pride, okay? Um, the heart of truth is God. And God is rightful in his elevated number one priority. Satan is illegitimate wanting to ascend to that. Go read Isaiah 14 um, about the fall of Satan. I will, I think there's five I wills where he wants to be. God and we see that pride coming right inside of us and it comes out with us lying most of the time we lie to make ourselves look better or to escape some kind of uh, trouble that we're in so he says this 
Uh, since you have laid aside the old self, so let me, the question comes to you. Are you actively involved in putting to death the works of your flesh? When is the last time you have been on your face before God, convicted of sin, and you're confessing it as sin? When is the last time you went to another person to get your sin right? If you're not involved in this, then you're not being obedient. And this is the greatest hindrance to people in the early stages of development of their Christian walk uh, to not continuing to grow. You, your job, your active participation in this is to put to death. And we went through the list. Look what he says. With its evil practices, meaning God doesn't guide you in these things. Uh, and practices is not just, I may commit one of these things, but I'm not going to live a lifestyle in them. Okay, So the difference between the lost world and the saved world is that the lost world practices lawlessness, practices these things that we just went through, the flesh living a lifestyle in them. But as a Christian, I'm going to be practicing righteousness. What does that look like? Coming into the light about your sin. Read 1 John chapter 1, the, the whole chapter. Um, this process we've been calling CCR. If you're not involved in that, if you're not involved in being convicted over your sin, confessing your sin and repenting of your sin, then you really have no solid biblical basis for assurance of your salvation, of your justification. Remember, the only way to have assurance of your justification is that you're going through the process of sanctification. The only way that you can have assurance that you're knowing God and the power of his resurrection is by the fellowship of his suffering. And this is what it is. Let's keep going. It says, And you've put on the new man, the new self, who is being renewed to a true knowledge according to the image of the one who created him. So we're getting back to the Eden. Okay, That'll be glorification where we're getting back to a perfect relationship with Almighty God. I'm looking forward to that day. Um, it says, a renewal in which there is no distinction between Greek and Jew, circumcised, uncircumcised, barbarian, scathian, slave, freeman, but what? Christ is all and in all. As Christians, uh, we're going to talk more about this this week, upcoming, but in the world right now, where everything is in chaos and there are a lot of hurting people. Christians must be on point. Don't get divided up like the world is trying to divide everyone up. In Christ, there's one dividing line, and that line is the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Now, it's so much different than the way the world uh, divides everything up. The world divides things up. Like, you believe what I believe or I'm going to kill you. But the dividing line of Christ is I want you to see Christ and I want you to be part of Christ if you're not in Christ. And the way I want to show you that this is real is I am willing to die for you. That's the big difference. Christ is all and in all. So those who have been chosen of God, set apart, holy, and loved, he says, put on a heart of, and then he's going to go through these things. So remember, you can't just get to the heart. That's the process. First with the mind, set your mind on things above. But this put on here is a different voice verb. It's middle voice. Meaning God's got to do this work. Um, you've got to willingly participate in putting off the old man. And then God is going to be forming this new man in us 
as we get to know him. So let's look through these. Um, verse 14 kind of gives this, it says, beyond all these things put on love. And I, I kind of an overwhelming, a general description of all of this is love. So we could sum it all up in one word. That's why he says above all is love. And I think there we are with the great commandment. Love the Lord your God. The result will be loving your neighbor as yourself. And he's going to go through, let's see how many terms. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and counting love, eight terms here. Um, all of these terms really have something to do with loving your neighbor. So it's going to be the result of your walk with God. Um, one in the middle is this humility. Um, I want you to think about humility. We've talked a lot about it being the result of putting off the flesh. It's the exact opposite of pride. Pride being the fundamental, foundational problem that began sin, pride. As pride is inward, it comes out um, with lying, with idolatry, all these other things. Then I start using other people. But as God starts doing a work in me, he's humbling me. What's it going to produce in me? Compassion. What is compassion? It's pity inward pity and inward mercy for other people. I like to say it's, it's this, the ability, the God-given ability to put yourself in someone else's shoes. And right now in our culture, please, in the power of the Holy Spirit, have conversations with people. But come at it from compassion. Instead of coming at it from your tradition and your experience and your reasoning, come at it from the revealed Word of God and listen to them. Have compassion on their tradition. Have compassion on their reasoning. Have compassion on their experiences and then point them to God. What's the next one? Kindness. So what is kindness if inward compassion uh, outward compassion would be kindness, uh, pity, and mercy extended to other people. Uh, we talked about humility. What's gentleness? Uh, gentleness is this willingness to be led by God. But even a willingness in that, that I'm willing to suffer for you. What we just talked about is uh, I won't want you to know Christ. And I am willing to lay my life on the line so that you can get to know Christ. You see, because my life is Christ. I'm hidden in Christ. He is my life. And if me sharing Christ with you ends my life, then it just advances me uh, to glorification. Now, that doesn't mean I'm just telling you, I'm just using you uh, so that I can get to glorification. No, I want you to be there with me in glorification. Look what he says next. Uh, the one that everybody doesn't like, patience, right? What is patience? Patience is the opposite of uh, resentment and the opposite of revenge. Um, I am willing to take it. I hear Christians talk about patience as if it were something um, bad. And if you describe patience as something bad, you really don't understand what a great uh, loving trait this is for other people. Has God been patient with you? The answer is yes. Are you glad that God's been patient with you? Now God wants to turn around and use you to be patient with others. What's next? Bearing with one another. 
Um, so I'm going to endure. There's no giving up. There's no throwaway people. Um, that's this idea. Forgiving each other. So forgiveness and compassion really kind of go together with kindness. One is focused on mercy, not giving people what they deserve. Uh, but forgiveness is really giving something grace, giving them something that they don't deserve. It's not giving them, uh, holding back something that they deserve. That's mercy. But giving them something that they don't deserve. Forgiveness. Um, go and read Luke 17. Uh, the first five verses it talks about first initially not being a stumbling block to others. But it says that if, if someone has done something against you, and they come and they repent to you, forgive them. Um, and if they, if they sin against you several times in one day, and they come to you and repent, keep on forgiving them. Okay, so it's giving us a little picture into the character of God. I'm open, I have a heart of forgiveness, but you and I cannot be reconciled until confession and repentance is walked through. Um, so let's keep going. He says these things. Um, Whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. So my motivation in forgiving someone is not what they've done or how big a person I am. The motive is that God has forgiven me so much that I understand forgiveness. And I understand that it's not earned. I want to extend that to others in the hope that they would see Christ in me. He goes on. Beyond all these, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And then this next word, let. I think you, you focus this let onto the put on and it kind of lets you sin. It kind of lets you see the middle voice. Allow God to do this work in you. And the only way that God can do this work in you, if you are doing what he's commanded you to do. You put off the old man, and then God, that'll be conscious. Conscious repentance of these fleshly things. And then there'll be this unconscious making this new man that God will do in you. Um, he says, uh, this is going to bring this bond of unity together. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called into one body. This is the church. Be thankful for this process, as John uh, says in 1 John. This process is not a burden. The burden, remember, is sin and trying to keep it covered up. The burden is taken away when we surrender to Christ. He takes the condemnation, and then we can openly and honestly deal with this. Um, it says, let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. Now, remember what these three are. Psalms are Old Testament uh, songs. The uh, hymns are New Testament uh, songs of praise, and spiritual songs are personal testimonials of praise to God. Is singing important? Yes. See, the Bible says, if you have a thankful heart, it's going to come out in singing. It doesn't say you're going to sing on pitch or on key. It just says you want to sing praises to God. Um, if you have a heart that is full of thanks, you just can't keep it in. Then he says this in 17, whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. Whew. That's quite a section that we went through. Putting off actively the old man, and then God will come in and start producing this new man. Now he's going to get into uh, these personal roles in our life um, of wives, Husbands, children, parents, uh, slaves and masters or employers and employees. So 
before we dive into this, I had this written in my Bible about dating. Okay, so we have, we're made up of three parts, every person is, body, soul, spirit. And I, if, if you want to be married and you're not, know that before we get into this section, nobody is forcing anybody to get married. Okay? God doesn't say every one of you is going to go out and get married. No. God does say if you want sexual expression, if you want to reproduce, if you want the joys of a physical relationship with another person, God's way to go about this is marriage. And if you're going to be involved in marriage successfully, you're going to have to do it God's way. So before we talk about marriage, I want to talk a little bit about dating. Because dating has turned into about the most immoral thing in the whole world. And I think it prepares people more for divorce than it prepares them for marriage. Let me explain. Every person is made up of body, soul, spirit. In the dating relationship, you really should be, it's like an interview, and you should be on your dating uh, experiences, finding out the spirit of the person. Where are they at spiritually? Do they... Have they surrendered their life to the Lord Jesus Christ? Are they growing in sanctification? Um, what kind of relationship do they have with God? Where are they at in the spiritual growth stages? You want, according to 2 Corinthians uh, 6, 14, you want to be uh, yoked together, coupled together with someone who is in the same place that you are. So dating is this interview to see where someone is in their spirit, okay? So then when we find out that this is a person that I am uh, equal with spiritually, I'm on the same page, the Bible calls it equally yoked, then we move into the engagement stage. This is the soul stage. So we got body, soul, spirit. So now we're talking about spirit, now my soul. I choose this person. We're engaged now. We are promising that we are going to get married. And then when we get married, then we give our bodies to each other. Okay. This is God's plan. Okay. And then we go through what we're going to talk about, about father, husbands and wives and our role in this. So think through this. Satan turns this around and messes it all up. So uh, remember, the reason God wants the body to be held for marriage is that in marriage we have this trust, committed relationship, right, that reflects Christ and the church. Remember, this is what marriage is all about, intimate union, reflecting Christ and the church. But just on a physical statement, uh, a sexual relationship is very important in a marriage because uh, as you're getting to know each other, it's difficult sometimes for sinners to get to know each other and we're going to be butting heads and a physical intimate relationship blinds you to a lot of the problems. So Satan turns this all around. So in the dating relationship, instead of uh, going with eyes wide open, trying to figure out where somebody's at spiritually. Now we go in and we get involved in a physical, sexual relationship in the dating, which blinds us to problems. And then we, we go move into being engaged. Uh, and then we go into getting married. And then we start trying to figure out where we're at spiritually, which is already too late. And it's a mess. And Satan loves the chaos of it. But if we would just submit to God's ways, we would be uh, successful. We would have peace. Do you want to have peace in your home? Uh, do you want to have peace 
at your job. He's going to lay it out for us right here, how to have it. Just think for a minute of the, the signs that your hand can do. Uh, we've got this, this sign, right? But if I take either one of these away, if I take this one away, then I'm trying to elevate myself, you know, I'm number one. If I take this one away and just put up my middle finger, I'm, it's, it's profanity toward someone else. Uh, so this, he must increase, I must decrease, is gonna bring peace. I'm gonna to submit to his way. Take either one of them away and you've got a mess. Even if you've got this, what does this mean? Take them all away. Um, this is a, 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 something about power that's being used right now all over our country. So let's just look at it. First, he begins with wives. He says, wives, simply put, be subject to your husbands as is fitting to the Lord. Do you want a, a greater detail? Go back and listen to the video that we did on Ephesians chapter 5. There, we went into greater detail. You can go back and look at this. But if you want to get married, ladies, you're going to have to do it God's way if you want to be successful. So here it is. Uh, submit to the leadership of your husband. Now, when you're dating, you better not be involved in a physical relationship. You better be examining whether this dude is spiritually mature enough for you to follow. See the point? Don't marry somebody because they got a pretty face. Don't marry somebody because they got a good job. Marry somebody that you, as a woman, are going to put yourself under and you can trust the loving leadership that they're going to give to your family, that it's going to point your family in the direction that God is, wants you to go in. Very important. Okay, um, You say, ladies, you may say, where do I find such a man? It's getting to be like trying to find a spotted owl. He says in verse 19, husbands, what? Love your wives and do not be embittered against them. So, uh, love. Actively, husbands, deny yourself for your wife. And then he adds on to this, don't become embittered. I've got a line drawn all the way back to uh, chapter uh, 3, verse 8. Where it says, but now you also put them all aside. The first one is anger. That's what this is. Bitterness. Okay? So he's saying to husbands, love your wives. Okay? Um, don't live a life of anger. Um, I did my senior thesis in college on uh, dating and marriage roles. And so I haven't had to do a lot of study on this, but um, it's interesting that Men um, don't just mature because they have responsibilities. Many men have responsibilities and they resent, they're embittered, the fact that they have responsibilities. So when somebody is mature, and only Christ can really do this, I relish the role that I have as protector and provider and leader in my family. And it, this is a manifestation of love to my closest neighbors. And men, the only way this can happen is if you have a vibrant daily communion with God where you're getting everything you need from God in the direction and then you can lead your family. Most men do not have a relationship with God. So therefore, they they know they're supposed to lead their families. So they end up leading their families into something that they do know about. If I know about baseball, then we become a baseball family. Or if I know about racing, we become the weekend race family where, oh, we do travel ball, whatever, whatever it is. God wants we men to be spiritual leaders. And we can't lead someone where we've never been. So, husbands, if you don't want to do this, don't get married. But understand, that if you want to be married and you want sexual expression, this is the only way to be successful. Let's go on. Children, 
be obedient to your parents in all things, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. The initial place where children learn about the character of God is through discipline and submitting to their parents. This is uh, going away in our culture, but uh, to our own detriment, as you can see. Children should be encountering authority uh, at the, right from birth from their parents. If they don't learn to submit to the authority of their parents, uh, if the first authority they're in contact with are the police, it's going to be a very painful ride. And we see that being played out. Um, but think about the roles in the family. Okay, so the, the, the wife submits to the husband. The children submit to the wife and to the husband. Um, really reflect the character of God. Uh, their submission right within of the Godhead. So we're made in God's image, so it's in our own relationships we're going to see the character of God. So God the Son submits to God the Father. God the Holy Spirit submits to both God the Father and God the Son, and we see that stamp right on the family. Uh, we actually see that stamp on every delegated authority that God gives. So um, then he adds this, fathers, do not exasperate your children so that they will not lose heart. Um, why does he pick on the fathers here? Remember, fathers, Father's Day is just around the corner. There is no divine mother. So uh, there's not a perfect standard to compare motherhood with. But there is, and you say, what about Mother Nature? Don't get into that. There is a divine Father who is perfect, holy, righteous. So when I take on the role of fatherhood, I must realize that I am now not just the father for this child, but I am also representing the Heavenly Father. And I want to make sure that I'm not provoking my children uh, in a way that God would never do. God would never provoke uh, his children and exasperate them. God does not want us to lose heart. He wants us to gain his heart. So we move from there to slaves versus masters and we'll close with this but there's much more written about this in Ephesians chapter 6. Um, we could say slaves are kind of corresponding to employees and that masters to employers. This It's the furthest degree though, right? At least an employee gets paid. A slave does not. So this is like the worst. The worst it can be, God can still work. Isn't this awesome? Uh, look what it says. Slaves, in all things, obey those who are your masters on earth. Do not with external service, as those who merely please men, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, do your work from your heart as to the Lord, rather than for man, knowing that it is from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance. What's the inheritance? Back in Philippians, remember the inheritance is getting to know God. If I'm a slave, the worst part of labor, right? I'm working and I don't have control. I'm not even getting paid. But know that if I do my work to the best of my ability, as if, and he is, the Lord is watching every bit of it, then I can get to know God even by being a slave. The Bible never advocates for slavery. It just recognizes the fallen world that we're in and that God can work through um, the brokenness of this world for anyone to get to know him. What's hindering me from getting to know God? It's not my circumstances. It is me. He says this, It is the Lord whom you serve. For he who does wrong will receive the consequences of the wrong which he has done. And that without what? 
impartiality. God doesn't play favorites. Remember that. Then he goes on. We'll just read one more verse. Chapter 4, verse 1 will connect this. Masters. So if you're the boss, remember this. Grant to your slaves two things. Justice and fairness. Knowing that you too have your master in heaven. So it's important to remind ourselves that if I'm the boss, I'm not really the boss. Just like if I'm the father, I'm not really the eternal father. I'm representing God. And I better be representing him in a correct way. Um, God provides justice. God provides fairness. Uh, but even in some points, God provides mercy and grace, not fairness. Boy, I'm glad that God goes above and beyond fairness. Uh, if I'm the boss, so should I. Um, much of the inequity and the problems that people have in our society right now is because there seemingly is no justice. Everyone is out looking out for number one and in order for me to look out for number one me I have to walk all over you and what's that going to cause in our culture exactly what it is causing chaos and destruction so uh, we've got a lot to chew on in Colossians 3 today I hope it's been a fruitful time for you in God's Word uh, I want you to be encouraged today father we love you Give us strength today as we mortify, as we put to death this, these works of our old nature. And Father, come produce in us your spirit, your fruit. And give us assurance um, in this today. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.